Hello everyone, my name is Emily Kosick and I'm the Knowledge Manager for the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment. Welcome to today's session, What is Knowledge Mobilization? Before we get started today, there are just a few housekeeping items I want to go through before we begin. All attendees are in listen-only mode. This is to limit feedback and noise. Today's session is also being recorded. You'll be sent a copy tomorrow, so if you miss anything, you can watch it again. The GoToWebinar launch window can be blocked by some organizations, so if you're having trouble hearing or seeing, you may have to join us using the phone link. We'll be looking for audience questions at the end of the session, so please send us your questions through the question box throughout the session as they come up. Just so you know, we've also attached handouts for today, an infographic in French and English of the main points of today's presentation, as well as a PDF of all the presentation slides. We've also included a wonderful article by a couple of today's panelists that will be a great read for everyone. A link has been placed in the chat with download instructions, and we will be posting these online later. So now let's start the presentation. I'm just going to swap my screen here. All right, so this series is sponsored by the Future Skills Centre and Research Impact Canada and is brought to you by the Community Engagement and Research Centre at the University of Regina. My partner, Dr. Lynn Gidlick, now, uh, presented last week. And so it's also presented, uh, of course, by my home institution, the Canadian Institute of Public Safety Research and Treatment. Well, today's event is taking place online and we have people from across the country joining us, the physical homes of the Canadian, uh, the Community Engagement and Research Center and the Canadian Institute of Public Safety Research and Treatments are on the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Nakoda, Dakota and Lakota First Nations and the traditional homeland of the Métis. So we'd like to recognize that we are in Treaty 4 territory. As I said at the beginning, my name is Emily Kosick and I'm the Knowledge Manager at SIPSERT. I normally get two reactions to that introduction. One, what a cool title. And two, what exactly do you do? The easiest way is to answer is to take all of the I take all of the fantastic research on the mental health of public safety personnel and make it accessible to frontline personnel, their leadership and policymakers. In today's presentation, I'm going to share with you a little bit about how I accomplish that goal. So, First things first, let's look at some of the terminology around knowledge sharing. So uh, it really sometimes does depend on the organization that's giving you funding. In Canada, CIHR calls it knowledge translation or KT. SHRC calls it knowledge mobilization or KM. And often outside of Canada, it'll be called dissemination, which is basically just the targeted distribution of information and intervention materials to a specific audience. Basically, they all mean the same thing, and that is processes and strategies designed to ensure that research evidence is accessible, understandable, and can benefit a range of knowledge users. The goal of KT and KM is to share knowledge in a way that's appropriate to the user of that knowledge. I'll be using the terms KT and KM interchangeably throughout the rest of the presentation. So why should, you, why should I consider doing KM? Why should you consider it? Well, there's lots of reasons. First, uh, the biggest reason is often that it's a requirement of many research funders. Most of us get our funding indirectly from the public or taxpayers, and those people de deserve to see what is accomplished with public funds. Funders also want to see that a return on their investment. But there are other more personal reasons, like you don't want your research to sit on a shelf, or you need to demonstrate the impact of your researchers to supervisors, university employers, partners, colleagues, Maybe you want to help advance science. We all want to help advance science and practice in our fields to close that gap between research and practice. And lastly, the most important reason is knowledge is meant to be shared. In order to do successful KT, it is important that you have a plan from the outset of your project. So things to keep in mind when you're doing a KT plan are, who's your research audience? What's your message? How can you effectively communicate the message? What might stop people from listening to your message? And how do you know if anyone got the message? We'll explore these concepts in detail in the presentation. First, how do you do KT? When do you do KT? When do you want to start? First, there's integrated KT. That's engagement from start to finish with the population you're studying. They help you identify the issues to study, the questions to ask, 
You're also offering the opportunity for inputs and suggestions at every stage. You build an ongoing relationship with stakeholders. So this is the most commonly used form of KT for community partnerships. The second kind is end of grant, KT or KM. This is a more traditional approach where you share your knowledge once the study is complete. This can be done through presentations, articles, or conferences. This type of KM is essential for fields that do not work with human populations, and it can still be very effective, especially when done well. So let's move on to our first consideration when you're planning your KT efforts. You have to plan them based on the audience you want to reach. The methods you'll use vary greatly depending on who you're talking to, and you should always consider your different audiences. If you focus on just one, you can lose opportunities to share your research with people who need it. So let's take an example. Let's look at policymakers versus the general public. A policymaker has different priorities than the general public. Their goals can revolve around budgetary constraints or political ones. In order to communicate your research to a policymaker, you might use a white or blue paper. You may attend forums, conferences, small group meetings where these people gather versus the more academic forums that you would normally attend. You'll also likely want to frame your knowledge into programs to be implemented or cost savings that can be achieved. The language in your reports would be need to be clear and concise so that they could easily understand it. But the general public is different. They don't attend forums and conferences, and they rarely have interest in something like a white or a blue paper. So how might you reach this audience? Tools like videos, summaries, social media would all be better ways to share your research with this audience. It's important to pick the right tool for the right audience. Next, you need to worry about your message. Having a clear message is one of the best tools you have to share your research. A good key message is concise, simple to say, focused, easy to understand, persuasive, and relevant to the audience. Sounds really hard, right? But your message can affect the impact of your research, so it's worth spending the time to consider what you want it to be. So here's an example. I'm a researcher doing work on a vaccine for HIV. My vaccine trial is the first in humans. I show that my vaccine is safe, which is great news, but it only has a 30% efficacy, which means more research is going to need to be developed to make a more effective version. So what should my message be for this research? The best way to frame it is the research is a major achievement since it provides the first evidence that development of a safe and effective HIV vaccine is possible. In this case, you'd want to focus your message on the fact that it was safe for humans and less on the fact of its efficacy, although you will want to make sure that people know more research is needed. The next thing to consider when you're making a plan is the words you use to communicate. They're just as important as the how and the to whom. Using plain language is often key to sharing knowledge with your audience. So why is plain language so important? Well, in Canada, 49% of adults with a university degree are still in the lower range for literacy proficiency, and 55% were in the lower range for numeracy proficiency. This actually increases to 88% of people who only have finished a high school degree. This, this does not mean, of course, that they can't read. What it means is that complex language often seen in medical documents, tax documents, and research is at a reading level that is difficult for them to comprehend easily. Plain language is designed to ensure that the reader understands as quickly and easily and completely as possible after one read. So important things to remember are avoid research jargon. Use everyday words. Not everyone in your audience has the same background as you. Be concise. It's really important to keep sentences and paragraphs short. Avoid ambiguity. I've given an example here of an actual headline. And so the headline reads, Enraged Cow Injures Farmer with Axe. So while it's true the farmer had an axe and that the cow injured him, it's unlikely, as the sentence suggests, that the cow injured him with an axe. So it's important that when you're, especially when you're making messages or sharing information, that you avoid that ambiguity. It's also important to use an active voice. This keeps your audience interested in what they're reading. So instead of saying the town was destroyed by fire, you would say fire destroyed the town. It's more active and, as I said, keeps people involved. The use of plain language is audience specific, but principles like being concise and unambiguous are important to remember with any audience. It's more important to be clear than to sound smart. 
The next thing you want to consider when you're making a plan is barriers. There are always going to be factors that may be a barrier to your research being shared widely or being used to make change. They can happen at any level, and it's important to keep them in mind when you're designing a plan for your KT or KN. I've listed some common barriers like lack of resources or leadership support, but there are likely barriers that are specific to your own project. It's important to take the time with your stakeholders and target audience to identify what specific barriers might be. So for example, if I've designed a program that will help police mental health, but it requires officers to attend a three-day session followed by a monthly check-in, a barrier to the success of my sharing knowledge and implementing this program might be a lack of time that the organization can invest. A way to overcome this barrier might be to offer an easy uh, an easily accessible online version. If I know this barrier ahead of time, I can plan to answer it when I'm sharing my research. The last important step for planning KM is evaluation. When you're implementing a program or a new piece of technology, the way you evaluate the success of a product is clear. But how can you evaluate the success of sharing knowledge? Well, there are three important things to keep in mind. First of all, is reach. How many people have heard your message? This can be measured in a variety of ways. People attending conferences or webinars like this one that feature your work, the number of articles that you write, op-eds you produce, number of social media shares. Next, you want to look at the usefulness. How many people found your research useful? This relates directly to how relevant you're able to make your research to different audiences. If you have considered your audience, message, language, and barriers, then people should find your research useful. You might measure it, though, through surveys or requests to present your information. Lastly, use. Are people using your research? Are policymakers using it to create change? Are other researchers expanding on your findings? So this could be measured through citations or downloads of your materials. There are so many options for sharing research, and I've got listed just a few of them here. While you may want to stick with traditional methods like journal articles and conferences for your academic audience, other audiences like the general public may respond better to more creative methods. Your only limit is your imagination when you're looking to share your findings. Your KM methods will also be different if you have a community partner, since you will have to consider what their needs are. For community research to be successful, it is important that the community be involved, so it is important that research for researchers to build relationships. It's also important to involve community partners at the earliest time, like when you are applying for a grant. Before you begin a project, there are some key questions to ask your community partners. You'll need to know the answers to these questions before you can agree to do the research project. So first is, how involved do you want to be? Next, who are the key groups? This is so that you could have an idea of who the different audiences are for the research and what information they're going to prioritize. Next, how do you want the findings presented? You may want to publish in a large journal, but a journal article may not work for your partner. They may want summaries or reports, perhaps a workshop. Next, what are your timelines and deadlines? In university research, we can take years to research or write publish, but your research partner may need to give funders and executives, etc., answers on a much quicker pace. It's important to know their expectations at the start. These are just a few of the important questions. Building a relationship will require both sides to listen and share what they need in a project. So, just as a reminder, the first step is having a plan. Funders are increasingly asking for KM plans when you apply for research funding. Instead of just a short paragraph about how you'll publish or present, take the time to create a real plan. There are a number of great KT planning tools, we have, and we've put a number of valuable links to this information on the infographics that are attached. They're also in the slides presented today. A full KT plan can set you apart when funders are making decisions. It will also make the process of sharing your research easier. Because if you don't plan for KM, then it likely won't happen, and your research might be left undiscovered. So we do have just a few uh, of the toolkits here that are available. And now I want to go ahead and bring our panelists. I do see two of them are here with us. Um, Dr. McDermott, if you want to go ahead and join us, I'll introduce you all to our audience. 
Hello. Um, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Morning. All right. So first, we do have Dr. Joy McDermott. She's a clinical epidemiologist, physiotherapist, and professional uh, professor of physical therapy at Western University. And I know there's so much more uh, there, Joy, and we'll put that information in the chat box. Uh, next is Dr. Charles Lepko. He's a professor and a Canadian research chair in sustainable food systems, health sciences at the department, uh, sorry, in the health sciences department at Lakehead University. Sorry, I'm looking at my other screen at the moment. Next uh, is Dr. Nadine Changfoot, Associate Professor of Political Studies at Trent University. Thank you all for being here with me today. So we are gonna go ahead and we'll start with the first question, which is what strategies do you use to create successful uh, KM? And I am gonna share a slide. I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Lepko, and I will share your slide for the audience. So if you wanna go ahead and answer that question for us, Sure, great. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I'll, I'll just say also by way of introduction, I'm uh, speaking to you from uh, Thunder Bay uh, up here in Northwestern Ontario. I'm an uninvited guest on the traditional land of the Fort William First Nation, uh, also signatory to the uh, Robbins and Superior Treaty of 1850. Um, and my community-based research is really focused on kind of building equitable, sustainable food systems. And I've really come to feel that it's very, it's impossible to kind of do this work without acknowledging historical and ongoing social environmental injustices really at the heart of the capitalist industrial food system. Um, that includes acknowledging my role as complicit in these realities and also as an ally in these struggles. And for me, I think this is really important, not just as a settler and a tenured prof in the academy, but also in terms of the work I do and knowledge mobilization uh, is a huge part of that. So as a, a, a scholar, I, a scholar activist, um, I, I work in allyship and solidarity with uh, the communities that I'm involved with. Um, knowledge mobilization, I think, as was shared in the presentation is a huge part of all stages of the research uh, and teaching that I do. Um, it's also rooted in the places and the relationships, uh, the connections to, to larger networks and efforts across scale and sector. Um, and, 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 and again, in partnership with community, not necessarily for community, but with community. So being community driven, community led, uh, making sure that the plans uh, are, 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 are important. So as you talked about in the presentation, having those plans, but also recognizing that uh, things can be emergent as well. And as we work with community, you know, things can change as we go. And so we at times have to be willing to put our academic uh, careers aside um, to make sure that um, the needs of the folks we're working with uh, are, are Form, forefront. So I just wanted to um, give one example um, of the of some of the strategies I've used. So this, I think, the slide you're looking at is um, is from a project I work uh, a group I work with called the Indigenous Food Circle, which is uh, a group of 22 Indigenous-led and Indigenous-serving organizations in the region up here, um, with really the aim of promoting Indigenous food sovereignty. Um, all of the work we do is really about giving information and making sure all the information goes back to the communities, the reports, gatherings, which always include food, um, uh, academic and popular articles, presentations and media. And also two of the things that we've done most recently and on the right there on your screen, you see we've done a series of videos um, which uh, have really been used as teaching tools to share some of the information, some of the knowledge that we're, we're, we're working with. So we've done videos on fish emulsion, trapping, uh, ghetto acostamine, squash, uh, seed saving and planting, rabbit snaring, access to wild game. Uh, and another project I'll just end with is this, uh, that thing in the middle, the 13 Moons Harvesting poster, which was a resource created by the Indigenous Food Circle in partnership with the Thunder Bay District Health Unit and the Sustainable Food Systems Lab. And it was really led by an Indigenous artist who through discussions with knowledge, knowledge keepers and elders, uh, provided this kind of snapshot of some of the cultural practices of the Anishinaabe um, past and present. Uh, so when we created this, it was a way to again, share back some of the knowledge in the form of a poster. So we have these beautiful posters. We also created this as a kind of game, an interactive game or a, a, a teaching tool where all those little, uh, the, the images you see come off, they're magnets. So we have a blank board that, you know, we can kind of walk through uh, sharing with back with the community. So again, this just that's just one one example of uh, how, we've, how, how we've done some of that work. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lepko. Just gonna hit the save here. I'm gonna pop the question back up. Um, so, um, Dr. McDermott, if you wouldn't mind asking, how do you make, oh, sorry, 
more than I'm going to use my three here. What strategies do you use to create successful uh, knowledge mobilization? Uh, so good morning, everyone. My work is with firefighters, and so I'm very fortunate in the way that the collaboration developed. I was approached by firefighters saying, we have problems that we think need research solutions and we want you to help us, which is not how always partnerships start because sometimes you are searching out the people that you want to partner with. But uh, by definition, what I have been able to do is called integrated KT. The firefighters were involved from the very beginning in knowing why they wanted this research done and what they were hoping to accomplish. Now, of course, many times we've had to discuss the totally different cultures between emergency response and academia. You couldn't pick two different cultures that could be more different, but we just discussed those. And so, for example, the first time we submitted a grant, the firefighters were like, the next day, great, let's start the work. And we're like, no, we'll hear in nine months whether we were funded or not. So a very different culture. Uh, so having people, of uh, uh, your knowledge users involved throughout the entire process, not making it just, uh, you know, we have somebody on the team who has one voice amongst 20 researchers. Um, establishing formal research priorities, like letting the knowledge users choose what they think are the important questions. And that's actually very hard for academics because they're taught to be leaders of research teams who define what the most important questions are. But the right approach is to go to your knowledge users and ask them what the right, right research questions are. And then talk, sometimes it comes down to what outcomes you measure. The outcomes that are important to researchers might not be the outcomes that are important to, to the knowledge user. And uh, finally, because I don't want to talk too long about something I could talk for days on, is uh, we use many different communication strategies, lay summaries. You can look at our website, firewell.ca. That's an ongoing platform where we communicate not just our own information, but other information. And having ongoing dialogues. We meet whether we have grants or whether we have funding and we talk about what we're going to do. Sustained relationships are really important. So I'll stop there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. McDermott. Uh, Dr. Chang, but I know that you had a slide to share, so I will go ahead and share that right now. And why don't you tell us a bit about the strategies that you use? Oh. oh, I think you're muted. Should just be a little microphone button. I've got it. Okay. Go. <laughs> I've got it. Sorry, I thought that I thought that that control was going to come from somewhere else. <laughs> um, <laughs> <thanks, Emily. laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm speaking from the traditional territory of the Michisagig uh, Chippewas Treaty 20, covered by the Williams Treaties. And uh, when you spoke about integrated knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization, that's where I see myself. And for me, uh, successful knowledge mobilization really germinates and grows from the strong relationships and partnerships from research pro processes that um, Charles and Joy had mentioned in their own experience. And I guess for me, I'd like to take a different tact. I, I'm thinking um, that um, principles, principles and practices of reciprocity, ownership and control and the continuing relationship are possible are so important um, for knowledge mobilization. So I'll highlight one of my projects titled Aging Vitalities, which is um, oriented toward uh, creating uh, new possibilities of aging. And um, so in this project, um, older um, women, uh, indigenous and settler, created short uh, two, to, two to three minute uh, films of their lived experience and their vision um, for aging, which was very unique um, for each one of them. And in terms of reciprocity, um, the, working with storytellers, um, I feel they really need to feel they are being heard and that their equity concerns are advanced. And this can involve building in formative evaluation moments um, to make sure that partners feel that um, the project is aligned with their, um, with their own visions and goals. And also, um, we need to have the chance to talk about failures. So I want to become more comfortable talking about failures because there are always emerging new areas to rectify um, and build toward, uh, especially around, in my project, access for disabled persons um, and reconciliation uh, with Indigenous persons 
and then also, um, you know, wrestling with the the power um, forces of power um, within research processes that tend to reinforce white Eurocentric settler able-bodied heteronormative norms. Um, and so, I think that reciprocity involves mindfully centering partners' uh, needs and processes. Uh, with regard to ownership, the storytellers own their films and they have control and choice over how they will be mobilized. And we discuss this together, um, the co-mobilization of uh, the films in a variety of educational forum, including classrooms, conferences, um, as well as um, Peterborough and Ugojiwanang's Reframe Film Festival and also scholarly publication. Um, and then also hearing Joy speak about the continuity of relationships as well as Charles, that's really important as well. Um, and on this slide, uh, there is a URL for uh, a recent Aging Vitalities podcast um, that was also in partnership with Dr. Katie Albright um, at St. Francis Xavier University. And moving from left to right on the slide, I think this, I think these photos in part tell um, uh, a story of the strategies um, and the relationships. Um, on the left, there are photos showing the research processes from the research creation of the films. And in the middle, there are uh, photos of the storytellers uh, showing uh, in the panel discussions at, uh, at the Reframe Film Festival in Peterborough, Nogojuang. And on the right, there are photos of storytellers um, in a Q&A after the screening of their film. So these kinds of knowledge mobiliza mobilization activities are envisioned, but they're not predetermined at the outset of the project, in part because such activities are really emergent and they really are very much in step with the process of relationship with storytellers. End of thought. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. So we are gonna move on then to the next question. Um, let me just swap the screen here. All right, so our next question is, how do you make non-traditional uh, efforts and outputs count when it comes time for tenure and promotion? Because this has often been a concern with people who do community-based research. So Dr. McDermott, I'm gonna start with you on that one. Uh, so first I'd say good news. I think that's possible and I think things are improving in universities and that they're becoming more enlightened about the importance of this work and CHR has certainly uh, become more uh, recognizing the importance of, of knowledge translation. It's it's in the act of, of CHR that they have to address knowledge translation. So um, I think there is increasing recognition of it and um, strategies that I use. One is I do have a section of my CV that's dedicated to uh, knowledge translation and I document there all my KT outputs and if I have any information on uptake uh, I describe what the activity was if there's a link to the outputs uh, and I describe who the target users were and what the goal of it was just like I would put a grant on my CV I put those things on my CV um, and I think many people fail to do that it's just a simple strategy but it is a, it's in, it puts it in people's faces. Uh, second of all, I share those, uh, some of the activities and outputs that I do with your university news uh, uh, paper and your public relations office to make sure that they're aware of what you're doing because um, some of the activities have gotten picked up by radio or other things and, and the universities love when their researchers get attention. So sometimes the attention to your KT activities is really a way that, they, that it gets recognized. Uh, third, um, having a, a, a good website that I actually have used as a vehicle to help others with their KT increases the awareness that you're working in the field um, and uh, you can track outputs of different things like how many times people go to your website, uh, how many things are uptake, uh, taken and to try to be really inclusive about all the different things that you do. So for example, sometimes your position uh, allows you to sit on a committee where a policy has changed. I think people have to really acknowledge and start recording all the things they do that are KT. Uh, if you sit on a clinical practice guideline committee, if you advise the government on something, those kind of things we tend not to put on our CV and we should be tracking them and their impact. And often KT is through stories. The uh, the, so the, keeping track of some of those stories and, and documenting them and saving them somewhere so that they get recycled and, and be viewed by different people over different times. So I'll stop there. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Changput, if you'd like to answer the question. Okay, sure. Um, I'm just writing down some of the things that Joy mentioned. Um, I'm finding them very helpful. Um, I'll personalize it a bit, my answer. I'll, I'll, I'll soon be applying for a full professorship, and so I'll make sure to connect the non-traditional outputs, such as the films and podcasts, um, uh, outlining the audiences, the impact, um, and then I'll also make uh, clear connections between these outputs uh, with, um, with scholarly outputs. So I'll give an example. Um, there, I have a forthcoming scholarly uh, paper entitled Revisioning Aging, Indigenous uh, Crip and Queer Renderings, and um, a suite of um, the storyteller, storytellers' films were selected for interpretation for the new cultural possibilities of aging that um, uh, I and co-authors are arguing for. Um, and so based on Tri-Council's recommendations to, for community partners to become involved in knowledge mobilization, I invited the storytellers to become co-authors of this, um, of this um, journal article um, through the contribution of their films. And then also, um, I realized that it was very difficult to separate the interpretation and analysis from the discussions that um, uh, storytellers and myself had. So um, this also um, came was an aspect of co-authorship. And then uh, finally, from a decolonial commitment, um, I was not at all comfortable with Indigenous knowledge through co -auth um, I was not at all comfortable with Indigenous storytellers having shared their uh, Indigenous knowledge and not um, owning or possessing the knowledge through co-authorship. Co -authorship. So it, it occurred to me that um, if their names were not co-authors, the Indigenous knowledge in the scholarly paper risked appropriation and dispossession. So I wanted Indigenous storytellers to be recognized as the authors of the knowledge created from their <clears throat> excuse me, stories and the uh, Indigenous knowledge within their films. So I think that this, um, this is an example that shows um, change, um, anti-colonial change that I, th that I think can be, you know, mobilized, for example, in a tenure application um, that shows the change that's occurring um, uh, within our research, within our research processes and the no knowledge mobilization of it. End of thought, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Lefko, I'll let you have the final thought on making these outputs count. Great, um, this is, I'm also typing lots of notes, this is good. Um, thank you uh, for jo Joy and Nadine. Um, and I'll just note, I think, uh, Emily, I'm not sure if you noted this, but uh, there's a paper in the handouts that Nadine and I uh, were part of writing, uh, which is a bit of an autoethnography on this very question. Um, and you know it's something I have thought about a lot because I've been I recently got tenure, my, um, so you know I have to think about this question specifically. And you know one of the things just from a context perspective, I think the as you know the the kind of context of this kind of neoliberal shift in in North American universities takes hold more and more, uh, it is becoming more challenging for for faculty pre and post tenure to you know kind of be able to to do community engaged research and to 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 do this kind of non traditional um, uh, knowledge mobilization because you know the pressures are so much greater. I mean I I'm in hiring committees now that I, I mean. You know, I hear over and over again that like, you know, that the, the the CVs are like more stacked than you know senior professors of people being hired out of out of university. So I mean, it's just it's I think there's a lot of pressure in that way. And you know, I think especially when you know the people evaluating us uh, don't necessarily understand or for that matter respect this kind of work is very challenging. Um, you know, when I was just going through my tenure process, you know, despite our university's plan, strategic plan, talking about knowledge mobilization and community engagement. I still had senior faculty counting the number of publications and specifically single, single authored publications. So I really had to make justify those things. And, you know, and also as a student, you know, I was, I was told over and over again, not to do this kind of work. It's just, it's too much. It's, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna distract you. You're not gonna finish. And I'm really glad I didn't listen um, because it became not just a part of my passion for doing academic scholarship, but also, you know, a real, my, 
my passion for living, my passage for life is just like being connected to these communities and, and learning from them with them together. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that I feel like in many ways though, and I don't want to like sugarcoat it, it feels sometimes like you're doing two jobs. Like you're, you're meeting the requirements of your university and your departments and your career, whatever, but you know, then, you know, so you're doing all the publishing and stuff, but you're also, you know, doing all kinds of things that often never even could sh you know show up anywhere things like you know sitting on a board uh having tea with people uh you know negotiating things that just take so much time that you know if you did it by yourself you wouldn't have to think of any of that so i think you know in terms of how to make it count i think you know i really agree with a lot of what's been said um I think we need to put these things forefront and really claim them as being ours and not just think of them as extra things we do on top of our academic work. So I really like the way um, uh, I think Joy talked about putting these things on your CV, having separate sections. Don't just make an academic CV that like comes out of a template, create your CV to like, you know, really highlight these things and put them ahead of your publications if you really want to. Um, you know, celebrating, uh, you know, the co-authorship. I think Nadine, your point about, you know, when I work with indigenous communities, I always, I always the same. I, I, I always act, like work with them as co-authors because I, it's not my place to tell their stories or appropriate their words. And I feel like that often with many communities I work with. So a lot of, if you look at my publications, there's usually long lists of people and most of them are not academics. And that's just a big part of how, I, again, I celebrate the word that work and, and forefront it. I think I've been using film a lot lately as a new, which is new to me, but you know, we're doing a lot of participatory filmmaking. I'm in the process of doing a feature film with some folks, uh, the chief of Batuana First Nations. And it's been a really wonderful process of, again, finding other ways to have, you know, community voices, uh, not just forefronted, but, you know, being at the, at the, at the, at the, well, at the forefront of, 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 of the work and, uh, and making, making knowledge outputs for them, not necessarily for me. Um, uh, so again, uh, the, the other thing I was thinking about is also seeking out allies in this work because it is so it can be so isolating. Seeking out senior allies. So if you have colleagues that can can support you in this work uh, and and help you figure out ways to do this, I would say do that. If you have a, I mean, a supervisors for those students listening, I think it's so important to have a supervisor that supports this work and can navigate you through and stand up when you need some backing um, and, and universities you know a lot of university strategic plans talk about community engagement knowledge mobilization and we need to force them to walk the talk if they're going to say they're doing it they need to do it and we need to make sure they're doing it so when you're going up for tenure promotion jobs so, like quote these things cite them you know tell them remind them that this is what they want to do and and you know you're someone or we're we're, we're people who do it um, and I just last thing I just wanted to say is I think again, and I, I'm not just saying like it's their responsibility. I am a senior, I'm becoming a senior professor. I'm tenured, and I think I take that responsibility. I think those of us listening who are in those positions, you know, if you occupy a place of privilege and power in the university, it's our responsibility to advocate uh, for these kinds of outputs. Um, not just in our research and our own personal work, but in our teaching, uh, helping understand students how to do this work, how to do it well, how to do it respectfully, uh, and then supporting them when they do it. So, you know, if a, if a thesis or a, a, a you know a class paper looks different, I think you know we need to support that. And we need to encourage that in our own in our own teaching. Perfect. End of thought. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful response. All right, so I have one last question for you guys and then we'll open up the floor to other questions. Um, how do you make a KM plan more than just a section on a grant application, more than just that paragraph that says I'm going to do it? And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Tankler, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, for me, uh, the visioning of a knowledge mobilization plan really comes from imagining the process of the research. Uh, and specifically uh, in the co-creation of a research process where uh, community partners really have the space to uh, make the project their own uh, in ways that are meaningful to them on their own terms. Um, and so again, uh, at this part, I'll, I'll just share that this, is, this involves positioning um, partners as knowledge holders and experts. Uh, I'm just thinking of during the creation and directing of their films, storytellers really entrusted uh, me and artists, scholar facilitators uh, with their experiences and their vulnerability around uh, aging and with 
really diverse and divergent materialities. Um, and researchers really need to guard this carefully or, you know, um, protect uh, it carefully with the direction of, this, of the storytellers in my case. And so the, mob, the mobilization um, that is brought into to the world really needs to be uh, based upon uh, reciprocity and transparency, uh, especially with consideration to ownership, control, um, access and possession, um, especially for indigenous persons. And so for me, it's um, just to sum it up, it's, it's a real, it's very much a living process. Uh, knowledge mobilization is very much a living process uh, with communities, uh, with commitments um, to, you know, reciprocity, reciprocity and co-leadership um, and decolonial labor uh, that really become renewed and enacted with each knowledge mobilization project. And then as Charles was mentioning, I can see how uh, there's so many aspects of um, myself as a researcher that gets plugged into, uh, for example, uh, university systems and processes and, you know, where I can make change um, in mobilizing knowledge from projects, whether it be within, uh, not only within classrooms and, you know, for example, sharing the knowledge, but also um, making change within uh, university policy and practice. Um, as well as community policy and practice, that those are really important um, opportunities to seize and to imagine as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lesko, I'll let you have the, the next answer. Great. Um, yeah, I think maybe what I want to say just builds on Nadine's words a bit. Um, I think um, I think we need to all ask ourselves like why we're in academia in the first place. Um, you know, for, for many of us, I think it's it's not just a job, it's something we care a lot about. Um, and I think that this is especially an important question when we're when we're working with people and you know, we're working with as Nadine talked about, people's stories. I think we have a responsibility to do research respectfully, and make sure it's meaningful uh, to the people that that we're working with and and also to recognize, you know, we are not separate from that 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 work you know we are there we, we have to think about our own positionality reflexively um and you know that's that that can be really beautiful it can also be really uncomfortable at times um a lot of times if we do it well um and you know so for me i recognize that a lot of my achievements and a lot of this work for me uh is related to my power and privilege as a as a white cisgendered man um and i've dedicated a lot of my my scholarship and and community engagement to kind of to thinking this through and kind of engaging with this. And, and um, I, you know, as I talked about before, I think it means that, you know, for me, aside from just trying to do it well, uh, and, you know, I know I have lots to learn in the process, um, that I think we need to advocate for its value, as I've said. And I think just to pick up on Nadine's point, it's not just about individuals doing that work, but we really need to think about how to, how institutional change needs to happen to not just make this more acceptable, but to make it more the norm, to make sure that if we're doing research, we are sharing it back. We are, you know, engaged in knowledge mobilization that isn't just, you know, translating knowledge to someone else, but to actually, you know, make them a part of it. And, you know, if, if especially if we're using people's stories. So, and, you know, and the, that can happen in many ways, but, you know, one way that, you know, I think we can, I, I would like to name is, you know, more black indigenous people of color in, in the university. I mean, that's a, a huge gap in almost every university I've ever worked at. And, you know, when white people are trying to tell other people's stories, it's that, you know, is again, one of those structural problems that I think is at the root of a lot of why, you know, things often go so awry. So anyways, end of thought. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, Dr. McDermott, I give the last word on this question to you. Uh, so, and I'll come from the framework of a CIHR researcher. I know that the way that, uh, so first rule of grant writing is you have to write to the committee who's evaluating your research. When success rates barely hit double digits, unless you write to the committee, you're not going to get your work funded and you're never going to get a chance to do the KT. Uh, so you have to do that. And so that means in CIHR, in a 10-page grant, you probably have half a page to three quarters of a page to describe your whole KT plan. And so it's going to be very uh, 
bare bones a description. I do use the CHA framework, which I find very useful in framing that to be as concise and clear about what will later become a 10 page description of what I'm going to do. And then after the grant, I think you really want to think ab about sort of key questions. So what are the messages or knowledge that has to be tr uh, translated? What are the goals of translating the knowledge? So we, we know research exists on a continuum. Sometimes you're trying to increase awareness. Sometimes you're trying to change processes or policies. Sometimes you're trying to change behaviors. There's a lot of different goals. And I have a tool that I'd be happy to share where I kind of list some of those goals that people might have. And in, in terms of why are you, what, what's the KT meant to achieve? And then thinking about what people need to be involved in that change process or changing that knowledge or implementing that knowledge. And only after I've thought about those things, you think about what strategy is best for which target audience. So you need different strategies for different target audiences and for different goals. And then you line all of those up um, and it's going to be multiple strategies and different strategies for different users. And so you kind of map all that out uh, and it's, ideal if you also map out what do I expect the outcomes of these strategies to be and how can I monitor if they're having any impact uh, on uh, in terms of uptake of what I'm trying to achieve but also impact on the goal of what I'm trying to achieve and so uh, going from that very short concise version to a more detailed plan that really focuses on who what and why um, I think is really important after you get the grant. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so we are gonna open the floor up to questions now. So if you have a question for the panel, please uh, let me know. I do have one question that we're gonna start with here. I'm just gonna make my screen a little bit bigger so I can see it clearly. Uh, I'm a graduate researcher, so sometimes I struggle with having limitations to my time, expertise, and freedom to do research. So the question is, if I have a project in mind that suits my needs as a graduate researcher, but also appears initially to be beneficial for the community I'd like to work with in, in translational research, if I make sure to incorporate research partners throughout the development of the project, does coming to the community with a set idea ultimately hinder or almost defy uh, KT and community-based research? I wonder about this and I would love your opinions on this. So um, Dr. Shankwood, I'm gonna give that one to you if you wanna start us off. Wow, thanks, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'm also a, a, a dancer and I, I remember Mikhail Varishnikov had said, you know, uh, if you wanna work with a certain choreographer or dancers, um, you don't say I wanna work with you. <laughs> uh, uh, although that is part of it, so, um, I, I think for this excellent question, my questions back to uh, the uh, to you would be, you know, what is your relationship already uh, with the community, and you know, how would you come come to understand that relationship as or, or describe it, and maybe that will be the starting point around um, making or creating a proposal. Uh, because what I have found is that, um, given my my embeddedness within different communities within Peterborough Nogojiwanong, uh, I find that projects are project ideas are percolated and they arise and surface um, as um, part of the imagina imagine, imagination uh, in of relationships uh, in conversations, and often that's how um, projects get um started or germinated or turned into something else so i think i'll stop there thank you and i wish you all the best <laughs> all right so next question and i'll give this one to dr mcdermott um is there a single type of kt product that you have found most effective uh for doing your research when, when sharing your research sorry let me say that quick <laughs> I have found that grant review committees have gotten much more sophisticated in the early days when everyone was forced to do KT plans. If you said anything at all about what you were going to do, it pretty well passed. But now they're getting pretty sophisticated in knowing what is, you know, fake, superficial. Like every, you know, you need a social media pl uh, plan, but 
everybody has one. So there's nothing innovative to be had there. Nevertheless, you still have to do it. So I do find that certain skills, like for graduate trainees, one of the most important skills to learn is how to write for the lay public. It's very hard for researchers and, and graduate students who are just learning how to write scientifically. Now to people say, okay, now you need to write at grade eight level and use non-technical language. And it's not a skill that easily comes to researchers. So that would be one skill that I think all researchers need to work on to communicate their results clearly. Um, you do need a social media strategy, and, and but I would say don't make that so time consuming that you don't have time to spend on the more important things, because I think there are more important activities than your social media strategy. And um, I, regular engagement, meetings with true discussion and planning with your team, that you, with your stakeholders, I'd say that's the most important thing to spend your time on. All right, so we've got one more question and then we will wrap up for the day. And I'm going to give that to you, Dr. Levko, you're lucky. Um, how do you reach out to a group that you want to partner with? How do you make sure they know what your, your KP plan is and what you what you want to do with them? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I feel like that's a question. If you asked anyone, they'd probably have a different answer. And And also, you know, it's, I think so many of these kind of questions are hard to answer in abstract because so much of it is based on you know our own circumstances and our our you know the, the the realities we're kind of in and I'll just say that like you know for me a lot of a lot of the work I do is with groups I already know and I already have relationships with rarely do I get involved in a project with with a group that I haven't kind of had some experience with or had some connection with and and part of my logic for that is it's exactly when these things come up like how like how do you negotiate how do you develop these I mean like it takes time right and I think you know I think Nadine and Joy have both made this point at different times that you know relationships are not project based they're not you know one time but they are ongoing and you know so for me like you know when you know I'm for example I'm developing a new project right now but it's again with an organization I've been working with for the last five or six years in various capacities so it's you know we've like that already means that kind of the work that we're doing we've already we like we've built trust we've built a relationship we have the kind of understanding of how things you know work with each other and yes there's always new elements to that and new things to think about new things to negotiate but you know it's it's we built we're building on an existing kind of platform of trust you know i mentioned this film i'm i'm doing with batchwana first nations i mean we've been working with that community for about 4 years now on various projects so the film wasn't just like hey we want to do a film and let's you know contact them and see how it works but it was something that through some previous conversations actually the chief raised to us of he really wanted to record some of their stories and then we applied for a grant together and got it so the knowledge mobilization kind of tool the film in this case was something that was predetermined you know we like it was something they had they were interested in and we kind of tried to build the capacity to do so again i think you know i i guess i maybe the simple answer to that question is i don't reach out i you know i kind of work with community like the, when I work with a with a partner with a community and and things uh, come up and maybe I'll just say one more thing because this is I you know you're gonna you're gonna end this but um I just want to I think you know for the students I know there's a, I know there's a number of students here uh, and I, I think you know we really I made I made a I made a comment before that you know I was told not to do uh, kind of community engaged research knowledge mobilization and I'm glad I didn't listen however I want to say that you know and I think everyone's made this point that knowledge doing good knowledge mobilization that's really rooted in community partnerships takes time it takes effort it takes skill in some cases and i think it can be really dangerous when people jump into it too quickly especially when you're in a graduate program and you only have say two years or a year to like do a project and i just think you know i i know i work with my students a lot to be realistic about what you can offer um you know there's costs involved there's ethics we have to follow um like research ethics boards uh, you know, and also like your job is not always just to go and cheerlead and champ, like cheerlead a group. That's often not helpful. Um, sometimes having some critical engagement is actually good because it helps them understand where gaps are. And, you know, and there's a certain skill involved in that. So, you know, and it's a skill that even, as I mentioned, I'm still learning. Like, I think we're always learning. So, um, yeah, so I just, <laughs> just want to kind of make the point that, you know, don't jump into if, if this is new to you, I think take the time, you know, talk to colleagues and friends and, you know, senior folks who have done this before and uh, uh, do it right. Because, you know, um, yeah, as I mentioned, I think we have a lot of responsibility as uh, as academics in this in this field. So.
Thank you for that final thought there. Uh, Dr. Chang, but if you have anything you wanted to add, I'll give you a minute if you have any final thoughts. No, I'm I, I'm I'm good right now. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. And Dr. McDermott, any final thoughts? Uh, no, just good luck with everyone. And one final suggestion is look at people who are good role models, who you see doing knowledge translation, who have different platforms and different ways of doing things. And you'll find some things that really might work in your situation so that you don't have to create the wheel from the beginning. Okay, perfect. All right, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and our audience for uh, joining us and paying attention. It's been great. Uh, there'll be a quick survey at the end of the webinar. We hope you'll take a moment to complete it. We also hope you'll consider joining us next week for the final session in the series, which is Building Successful Partnerships. Uh, in that talk, we'll bring together researchers and community partners to talk about their experience of building a successful partnership, which is key to doing good community-based research. Again, everyone, thank you so much, and you have a wonderful day. Take care and stay safe.